questions. Our next speaker is someone that is changing the world that we're going to be living in. He's changing the food that we're going to be eating. And so it's a real honor and privilege to welcome Professor Yaakov Nachmayas, who is going to talk to us about lab-grown proteins. Thank you very much. So I was uh, yeah. invited here to, to this incredible event, and I looked at the lineup, and I saw that so many people are talking about artificial intelligence and commerce, and I thought, wait a second. We're talking about Israeli technology. How can we not talk about food? So we put the other startups aside and focused on future meat technologies. You know, today was a warm day. You know, it's, uh, there's a heat wave, bless you, coming over Europe. And so it's a little bit strange to think about it, but really, this is from the majority of our evolution, we have not had this wonderful warm day. Actually, as a species, we evolved during the last ice age. So for a million years, this, in, this entire area was under several miles of ice. And in that environment, it was very difficult to get food. So when somebody finally managed to kill a holy mammoth, everybody would eat. And with the invention of fire, suddenly, protein and fat became available for us. Now, protein is critical. Protein is what allows us to build mass. And for us, mass is children. So you move from 10 people to 20 people to 200 people to a small village like London. And then fat is also critical for us because fat is a central component of our nervous system. It enables us to build a bigger brain. And this is a key feature of our evolution. So meat, that mammoth, that eating and grilling of meat was really a key step in our evolution. This is why meat is really celebrated around the world. It doesn't matter if you are in South America or in Africa or in Europe or in Asia. Meat is always the center dish on the table. Now, this essentially means that, well, as delicious as this looks like, um, especially to my wife who has been a vegetarian for over 17 years, it simply does not generate the same emotional response as this. <laughs> so, and this is the funny thing, right? Because you can smell this. And um, so for many of us that eat meat, we are actually craving it right now because it tingles the same neuronal circuits that evolve with us. For those of us who are vegan, and keep telling us that they're vegan, um, <laughs> we, they have to convert this craving with another feeling. You can't be apathetic to meat. So many of them either force work, constantly work against that craving or replace it with hate. So they detest meat. But you, it's not like tofu. You can be apathetic to tofu. This is why you know, we have mega companies right now you know, struggling to take protein, plant-based protein, and make it like meat. Uh, and companies like Beyond Meat, and Impossible Foods, and Nestle are actually challenging this field because, honestly, we have to. We have rich capacity in meat production. Okay? We're using an immense amount of our land, about 40%, to grow the cattle and the food for the cattle. And this is happening at a time where, well, in the UK, more people are becoming vegetarian, and that's great. But for every 10,000 vegetarians we have here, well, we have about half a million people becoming carnivores in China and India. So this is really, really, really uh, going to be a major problem over the next decade. Uh, now, we can do a lot good replacing the structure and, and and protein content, um, and it feels like meat. There is one major problem. It doesn't smell like meat, and it doesn't taste like meat. And the reason it doesn't is because, well, it's missing this white stuff. Um, and this white stuff is actually the fat. What we are craving is the grilled fat. Grilling of fat releases hundreds of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And this is essentially what creates the aroma and the umami flavor of meat. And there is one technology on the market that can actually do that, and that's cultured meat. And the concept is relatively simple, and it's been with us actually for more than 100 years. We can take animal cells, grow them, 
in mass in bioreactors, and then essentially assemble them into meat. So we can make both the muscle and the fat. One problem. Well, the first burger cost about $2, mil uh, about $2 million per kilogram. And today, even the most impressive companies uh, like Memphis Meat are actually manufacturing it for around $8,000 to $20,000 per kilogram. And there are very few people that are going to be able to afford a $5,000 steak. Um, this is a major issue. And essentially, what you, what you, when you're looking at this parameter space, what you're seeing is the following. You know, traditional meat agriculture uh, is somewhat effective. We eat about half of the cow. But the feed for the cow, what we need to feed it to actually grow, is relatively cheap. Uh, companies like Beyond Meat, with their incredible IPO, essentially they, their yield is, is very, very high. So we can eat all of the protein that came from the plants. But to do that, to get the texture right, they had to break it down to proteins and fats and then recombine them. So their cost is a little bit higher. Well, if you are doing cultured meat and you're growing stem cells, you're actually at the bottom left corner. Not only are your cells not growing very efficiently, but the culture medium that you need to maintain them is incredibly expensive, hundreds of dollars per liter. So you can genetically modify these cells to grow faster and to grow forever, but that means you can actually have genetically modified cells. So the GMO label is kind of difficult, but this is where you know, companies like Memphis Meat went for. They still didn't increase the, pro the, the process yield. You can grow the cells faster but, and for cheaper, but the yield is not that great. What makes us different is the fact that we develop not only cells that will grow forever by a process called spontaneous motorization, but we can actually do that in a bioreactor that is going to be cost efficient, placing us right between traditional animal agriculture and the meat mimicry companies today. So how is this done? So to understand why this is happening, you need to understand how we grow cells right now. We take cells and we put them in this nutrient growth. So this, we call it culture medium. And the cells, because they are, keep on growing, they released waste products. The main one is ammonia. Essentially, they're growing in their own urine. Uh, and while we're doing that, you know, we need about, to make a kilogram in the lab, we need about 200 liters of this stuff. We need to dilute out the urine, the ammonia. And even in bioreactors, you know, we are limited to about one kilogram per 10 liters. So you know, the best we can hope for is $200 per kilogram, which is not good enough. Animals like us or chickens or cows don't need to deal with it. Actually, for every kilogram of mass, we don't have 10 liters. We actually have, well, half a, half a cup of water. That's how much blood we have for every kilogram that we are growing. And the reason we are so effective at doing that is because we have a liver right here. And the liver removes the ammonia, and the kidneys get rid of them. And essentially what we did is we developed a bioreactor technology that allows us to do exactly that. We can continuously remove waste products and get to a price point that is about $20 per kilogram of biomass, even if we, if we just use off-the-shelf components and off-the-shelf media. That means essentially today. And the second you drop the cost to $4 per liter or $2 per liter, that's going to be the production cost for that. The major advantage is that you can do that in smaller factories, so the capex requirements are also small. So this is great. Let me show you what we did. Uh, these are the first cell lines that are completely immortal. They are actually fibroblasts that we take. They grow very, very fast. They double every 20 hours in mass. And they will grow forever. That single cell line, and we have seven of those, both chicken and beef and soon lamb, can feed the entire world forever. But it's not going to be tasty to eat it like that. So what we do is we convert it to fat. So this is fat, and this is only small molecules being used here. No genetic engineering being used, no foreign modifications, only small molecules. Um, all of them approved by the FDA for human consumption. So this is great.
too much noise. Indistinguishable from meat. So this is how it looks like. Okay. So it has the flavor, the texture, and the aroma of meat, where the protein content and the texture are coming from the plants, and the smell and the flavor are coming from the fat. Here's a neck-to-neck -neck example. One of these is real chicken. The other one is ours. Neck-to-neck -neck comparison, including a cross-section, so you can actually see it. Okay? Uh, what it means is transformative. A single 600 bioreactor uh, from our technology can do amazing things. 600 liters is essentially the size of your refrigerator at home. Okay? In that 1,000 square feet facility, we can make half a ton of fat every two weeks. That means two tons of mass. It doesn't matter if it's beef or chicken or lamb or pork. Well, not pork here, but in other places in the world. <laughs> now, a chicken takes about six weeks to grow. That means in your refrigerator at home, you will have the capacity to make essentially, essentially 3,000 chickens, the equivalent of six or 3,000 chickens, every six weeks, or 360 cows every 46 months. OK? We're talking about massive transformation. And also, about, think about the vertical integration of this. You can use the same bioreactors, just change the feed and the starting culture, and change your production every two weeks. You want pork for Christmas? Here we go. You want beef for Memorial Day, for hamburgers? Here we go. Do you want lamb for, uh, lamb for uh, uh, Passover? Here we go. Right? So, and it's very, very fast. And you can think about what, what farmers and companies need to do right now to take a cow and then wait for 46 months, and then they sell it and they don't even know what the market price of the meat is. So this is why there's major assumptions of this technology essentially starting to take over the world. And I wanted to give you a little bit of perspectives, but I'm running out of time, so I'll do it super fast. What it actually means. What it means is that the next farm next to you, whether it's beef or chicken, is going to look like this. You know, not very different from a brewery. Okay? And to replace 30% of meat production worldwide, there's actually a lot of things that, we need can, that, that, are trans, that come from that up and down the value chain. You know, we need about 1 million ton of stainless steel just to grow it, just to build it. This is how many bioreactors we need, about a million of them. Each one is about a ton. But that will give us the capacity to do this, to essentially generate 12 million tons of cultured meat every year. Uh, we can go through the numbers, but all of them make sense. The interesting thing is that we, can actually, we, need, we will actually need to double the amount of corn, corn syrup production which is very, very interesting because it's the first thing that useful that we're going to do with corn syrup. <laughs> um, finally, I will just leave you with, that, with one map. This is land use in the United States as it is today. Now, you can see about 650 million acres actually used for pasture and range. And the brown, the cropland, about half of that is to feed the animals that are grazing and, and walking around. Now, if we use cultured meat technology and we actually replace all of that, that means we can release anywhere between 50 to 80% of the land that is currently in pastures for pastures and range, free-ranging animals. We can replace that with well, wild-type forests because that's what you, the United States used to be before we logged everything. That essentially means that we can remove about 50 billion tons of CO2 over the next decade, making the United States carbon neutral for a decade, giving us time to do a lot of different things, like, for example, eating, eating chicken. Thank you. Well, thank Sorry. you. Okay. I, made, I made a very bold claim that today we were going to inspire you. And I realized that I think hopefully we have done exactly that.